Good evening. My name is Cindy Heitzman. I'm the Executive Director at the California Preservation Foundation. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this evening's event, the 2021 California Preservation Awards. The California Preservation Foundation's mission is to protect historic and cultural resources in California through education and advocacy. And the awards program helps us to teach by example. These remarkable preservation projects, large and small from across California, connect us to our past with the promise of continued use and appreciation by future generations. For each and every winner, now and in the past, your work inspires and informs us, and we thank you. And now, I would like to welcome our president, Adrian Scott Fine. Great. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, good evening, everyone. As president of the California Preservation Foundation, the Board of Trustees is very happy to see you all here tonight and joining us for the 38th Annual Preservation Design Awards. Now, these awards honor organizations and individuals whose work represents the very best in preserving our architectural and cultural heritage and furthers historic preservation practice and conservation throughout California. And tonight, we are honored to present Preservation Design Awards to 20 diverse projects representing all parts of California, including two still to be revealed trustees awards for excellence that recognize exemplary project work, and in this case, also an outstanding adaptive reuse, and also two president's awards, one for a lifetime achievement in heritage conservation to a most deserving recipient who has made an indelible mark on preservation in Southern California and beyond and another to a recipient who has led advocacy effort, efforts towards win-win outcomes and brought us a new innovative way of thinking about and protecting intangible heritage and legacies. This year's winners reflect California's can-do spirit of ingenuity, providing creative solutions for documenting, preserving, and re-envisioning historic places throughout the state. Award winners include significant technical and conservation achievements, including restoring a modernist place for geophysics study, rehabilitation projects that reinvigorate a diverse array of historic places and cultural institutions, and projects that represent significant municipal and philanthropic investment in California's history, preserving and protecting public spaces, historic districts, and even a couple of historic swimming pools. Each winning project from beloved green monsters to adapting buildings for much needed affordable housing and community serving spaces to mural and interior restorations to breathing new life into fire damage and empty spaces and to adopting a historic building that welcomes needy animals to a safe space. How can you not love any of those things? These all represent a significant achievement in preservation practice. So congrats to you all. And now I would like to take a moment uh, to thank and to recognize all that made this possible tonight. First, on behalf of CPS Board of Trustees, I would like to thank our sponsors. Their generosity makes possible not only this awards program, but honestly, all of our educational advocacy efforts throughout the year. So thank you for your support. I also would like to uh, share and extend a heartfelt thank to all, thanks to all those that go out um, to everyone who supports CPF throughout the year. We really appreciate your support, so thank you. The Preservation Design Awards are the culmination of months of preparation and hard work by the applicants, jury, and our CPF staff. The interest in this program grows each year and tonight's 20 diverse award winners represent a fraction of the projects nominated for review. And for all their hard work, and in particular, their extraordinary creativity and enthusiastic ability to always adapt and get the job done, I would like to thank our remarkable, small but mighty CPF staff, Cindy, Cindy Heitzman, Executive Director, John Haber, Field Services Director, and Christine Madrid French, Development and Marketing Director. We would also like to thank and extend a thank you to and recognize the jurors who devoted their time and talents to this year's program. Philip Aguilar, Suzanne Brown, Paul Hulagian, Nina Maju, Jennifer Pont, Lydia So, Alan White, Roderick Wiley, and Kevin Zuko. Thank you, jurors. You will all be hearing more from the jury throughout tonight's program. And with that, 
I'm going to turn things over uh, to CPF trustee, Bill Schaefer, who along with Andrew Wolfram serve as our co-chairs for this event. And so thank you to Bill and Andrew for your commitment to this program and for everything you do to make this night possible. Thank you. Good evening and thank you, Adrian. I'm Bill Schaefer and as, and as Preservation Design Awards co-chair, I'm thrilled that tonight we're honoring leaders in the preservation field individuals and organizations whose groundbreaking work in preservation has had positive results throughout our state. This year, we received preservation design awards from every corner of the great state of California. The submittals are nominated by the public in one of seven categories. And this year, the winning projects were selected within five of those seven categories. The first category is cultural resource studies. Preservation or restoration. Preservation, technology and craftsmanship. Reconstruction or contextual infill. And lastly, rehabilitation. Sometimes a project will stand out, striving for and achieving a higher standard, and these projects have been awarded the Trustees Award for Excellence. This award is at the recommendation of the jury with approval by the Board of Trustees. These projects set an example for others to follow in the future, either for the quality of the work or because they set a higher social standard. And now our first set of awards. Before we jump into the awards, we're going to play a quick introduction of our jurors. Greetings from Southern California. My name is Phil Aguilar. I'm a construction manager at Plant Construction located in San Francisco that specializes in historic renovations. Hi, my name is Suzanne Brown and I'm a partner at Equity Community Builders in San Francisco. Hi, I'm Paul Halogen. I'm the principal of Paul Halogen Architects in Clovis, California. I'm a member of the American Institute of Architects, California Board of Directors, past president of American Institute of Architects, San Joaquin, and I'm a member of the City of Fresno's Historic Preservation Commission. Hello, my name is Nina Majoub, and I'm a principal at Homes, running our Los Angeles office and providing structural and fire engineering services. I have particularly enjoyed working on historic and existing structures, helping to develop seismic retrofit and renovation strategies that are sensitive to the historic fabric of our structures. Hi, my name is Jennifer Pont. I'm an architectural conservator at Architectural Resources Group, or ARG, in San Francisco. Hi, my name is Lydia So. I'm the principal architect of Solid Architecture Management and Design. We specialize in adaptive reuse on retail and residential projects, real estate consulting, and public art management. It is my honor to also serve as a Historic Preservation Commissioner for the city and county of San Francisco. Hi, I'm Al White. I'm a technology consultant with Acquire in Los Angeles. I specialize in non-destructive evaluation and digital documentation of historic buildings. I'm also the vice president of the Western chapter for the Association of Preservation Technology. My name is Roderick Wiley. I'm a landscape architect with Surface Design Inc. based in San Francisco. Hello, preservationists. I'm Kevin Zuko. I'm an executive principal at ZFA Structural Engineers with offices in San Francisco, Silicon Valley, Sacramento, Napa, and Santa Rosa. Our first awards category are for cultural resource studies 
and reports. And the first award in that category goes to Fort LA for their Fort Trails program. Fort Trails is a civic discovery initiative celebrating Los Angeles through exploration and education about residential architecture. able to find Fort LA just to explore neighborhoods and historic homes in Los Angeles. So apartment apartments are two-story buildings that are organized in courtyards to create a sort of centralized space. Despite the pandemic, inventive minds have conjured a Halloween season for Los Angeles residents. I'm Sarah from Tastemade, and today I am taking you on a tour of Los Angeles' storybook architecture. Well, I've always thought of LA as a city of strip malls and parking lots. I never really thought of it as an architectural city. Take a walk and discover some residential treasures. This book tells the story of how historic preservation is impacting the city of Los Angeles. It draws on findings from Survey LA to highlight neighborhood revivals, the regeneration of downtown, and it shows us how historic preservation is guiding the future of the city. Illustrated with stunning photography from every corner of the city, Preserving Los Angeles should encourage anyone who reads it to get out and explore the city. Los Angeles has developed one of the most successful historic preservation programs, culminating with Survey LA, the most ambitious citywide survey of historic resources in the nation. Preserving Los Angeles highlights this preservation story with more than 300 full color, color photos, including images showcasing dozens of Survey LA discoveries, lesser known historic resources in every corner of the city. Preserving Los Angeles tells and illustrates how historic preservation has helped transform California's largest city. The Sonoma Trail District and Cottage is a great example of how to bring through programming and restoration a new audience to historic structures uh, in an otherwise neglected site. Researching the historic context of Mesa Nave Cottage, which was slated for demolition by the city of Sonoma, an architectural historian discovered an intact Victorian neighborhood and train depot and concluded that the buildings contributed to a previously unidentified historic train district. The 2016 evaluation found that 80% of the Victorian buildings around the depot were intact and determined that the train district was eligible for the National Register of Historic Places, which saved the cottage. The next category is preservation or restoration. This faithful restoration of facades with their prominent redwood and fir features has breathed new life into the Monk Lab at the Institute for Geophysics and Planetary Physics. Years of deferred maintenance and coastal weathering has been reversed while preserving the original design intent and extending the life of this California and National Register building for generations to come. The Institute of Geophysics and Planetary Physics Monk Laboratory is located at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in La Jolla and part of the UC San Diego campus. Designed by architect Lloyd Rocco, FAIA, the building is named for renowned oceanographer Walter Monk. The exterior restoration project returned the structure to its former glory, reversing decades of deterioration by restoring original redwood and Douglas fir features throughout the building.
The old Orange County Courthouse rehabilitation in Santa Ana was a favorite amongst the jury in the rehabilitation category. The documentation and photographs clearly communicated the seriousness of the effort to preserve the sandstone and granite facade of this treasured public building. The old Orange County Courthouse came back to life after the failure of a stone corval alerted its stewards to investigate its condition and maintenance. Laboratory analysis of Arizona sandstone and concrete was completed. Trial repairs and mock-ups established the scope of work. Restoration included strengthening the transom stone between windows, securing the sandstone facade, repainting the plastered gable, repairing a protruding concrete bond beam, and replacing co copper roofing. The jury saw the project as a beautiful structure and unique in that a bridge isn't something that we don't often see entered for awards. As a bridge, it has a very strong structural presence. In particular, the bolted connections which were restored caught the jurors' fancy. Careful detailing emphasizing the shapes and angles preserved the inherent elements. A full seismic retrofit was included through the use of concealed structural steel and replacement of critical members. The picture bridge at Langham Huntington Hotel in Pasadena charmed guests of the hotel for generations. The collaborative restoration with Pasadena Heritage replaced only wood pieces with irreparable damage and integrated a new wood-clad steel support system that's entirely hidden from view to maintain the historic aesthetic. Facsimiles of the 40 paintings of iconic California landscapes and landmarks were installed until the original 1933 paintings can be restored. For those that are just joining us, welcome again. We're happy that you're here. We're only just beginning. So uh, take a look at the next round of projects that we can showcase and celebrate. Uh, we're just getting started. And again, we have a few projects still to unveil in terms of award winners. So let's continue. Thank you. Our next award category is Preservation Technology and Craftsmanship. The project at the Annenberg Community Beach House Pool rose above others because of the creative solutions to some of the challenges that the project team came up with. We were impressed at the care and quality of the restoration, considering the impact of not just tight construction deadlines for an active community pool, but of course, the COVID pandemic. Despite these challenges, the project team was able to quickly and easily pivot when issues arose without compromising the quality of the restoration. Our attention was immediately grabbed by the methods used for the survey. And as an architectural conserver, I think a scuba survey is officially on my bucket list. And the first award goes to the Annenberg Community Beach House, which was once owned by William Randolph Hearst and is one of Santa Monica's most treasured community amenities, open to all. Mothballed after the 1994 Northridge earthquake, this project successfully preserved and regenerates the distinctive historic materials and craftsmanship of the Julia Morgan designed beachfront public pool. The treatments including the conservation of the tiled pool deck and of the beautiful hand-painted decorative tiles at the pool crop bottom in a polychrome fish motif. The next award goes to Los Angeles Union Station. So why this project? Why did it rise to the top? As the research undertaken, uh, the original style of the decorative and techniques of the Mission Modern period. The return of a grand transportation hub and public ownership of a prominent mode of transit from the 1940s that is not auto and airplane focused. Built in 1939, the station still serves almost 110,000 passengers a day near downtown. 
The restoration work encompassed the conservation of major public spaces, including the grand waiting room, the ticketing concourse, and the entry vestibule. Materials included metal, wood, and soapstone restoration, the reinfiguration of the booths, and decorative paint and finish restoration of three areas to ultimately bring the interior and exterior back to their original brilliance. The next award goes to Our Lady of Rosary Church in San Diego's Little Italy neighborhood. The conservation of original murals and the replication of the historic decorative scheme has really transformed this church. And a project that has engaged the community, has been funded by the community, and should be enjoyed by the community for a hundred years to come. The church has inspired and uplifted the faithful with beautiful artworks, stained glass windows, gilding, and trump loyal details for nearly a century. The once vibrant murals by renowned Venetian painter Fausto Tasca became obscured with layers of soot and discolored varnish. After a successful fundraising by the church, the organization ex executed a complete restoration of the interior based on the historic design. The next award goes to the First Congregational Church of Long Beach. First, there was the design of the steel and terracotta structure of the window in order to not just repair the damaged window, but to make sure that it would be resilient against future damage. Then there was the fact that despite the level of intervention into the masonry that was required for seismic upgrades and repairs, so much of the original material and historic fabric was salvaged. This project sets the bar very high for continued projects on the church and future restorations of their windows. This multidisciplinary $2.4 million project rejuvenated the terracotta rose window and other architectural features of the church. The stained glass window was removed for studio conversation and the embrittled tracery of the East Rose windows was dismantled. A seismically robust, corrosion-resistant stainless steel armature replacement was designed without the need and expense to disturb the window's original mahogany tracery lining and decorative plaster trim. Hey everyone, uh, John, we need to minimize Adrian's window. Welcome to the awards showcase gala. We wanted to just remind everyone that you can vote in the uh, People's Choice Awards and John's gonna post that link in the chat. Um, if you wanted to uh, go ahead and, and vote for people, you can. Uh, so we are going to announce that towards the end of the show and we wanted to welcome everyone. We have people from at least 15 states and Canada in the audience right now. And if you want to talk to your friends, you can say hi in the chat window. I know John is just waiting to hear from everybody tonight. We want to welcome everyone and thank you very much for joining us. And now we are going to go to the next round of videos. Roll yes, and, and for those of you who are voting uh, for the People's Choice, if you hit a message, we uh, suggest refreshing your window and trying it again. Uh, there's a participant limit, and it looks like we blew up our polling uh, thing just because of the number of people that are uh, involved tonight. So thank you all for voting. We're still receiving votes, so uh, we will continue with part three of the video, and then uh, we'll move on to the other parts of the program here. So Hit it, John. The next category is Reconstruction or Contextual Infill. Gregory Ines' 1952 Marjorie Green residence was destroyed in a fire in 2018. Through extensive research of the archival material and investigation of the charred structural members, the restoration architects masterfully recreated construction documents right down to the built-in furniture. 
as much of the original structure as possible is salvaged. Well-crafted glazing de details are a prime example of the faithfulness and sensitivity of the architects to follow the original design, while in that case, achieving better thermal performance to meet current codes. The Marjorie M. Green residence was severely damaged by fire. The 1952 home was designed by architect Gregory Ain, with landscape designed by Garrett Ekbo. All interiors, furnishings, and original blueprints were destroyed in the conflagration. Slated for demolition by the insurance company, the house and garden were fully restored through archival material and the recreation of construction documents based on a period exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art. And the last category is rehabilitation. What I really liked about this Balboa Park Pool project is this level of complexity. Faced with very limited budget and a set of really restrictive historic preservation guidelines, progressive sustainability guidelines, and local building code regulations, this is not a small potato to take on. But the project team had managed to deliver a lot, ranging from retaining its major character defining features of its exterior to also innovatively implementing an extensive use of gray water reuse system to achieve its sustainability goal. Balboa Park Pool is a municipal treasure serving one of San Francisco's most populated neighborhoods for more than 60 years. This rehabilitation enhanced the building's social and recreational programming and preserved its iconic 1958 international architectural style. Seismic improvements preserved the character-defining concrete structure and large glazed openings with interior brace frames and concealed shear walls. This reinvigorated local icon and auditorium improves wellness and recreational equity among the underserved communities. Lisser Hall on the campus of Mills College in Oakland, California was designed in 1901 by Willis Polk and renovated in 1927 by Walter Ratcliffe. Among other things, this well-executed project brought a masterful seismic retrofit, mechanical, plumbing, and electrical system renovations, accessibility upgrades, and new technical infrastructure that included movable seating to enhance flexibility and support interdisciplinary performance. Perhaps most importantly, the project offers a refreshed attitude about the connection of the building to the campus plan and the connection to Leona Creek. A new wood deck with crisp and contemporary detailing connects the lobby to the creek and creates a vibrant space for student life. The Lisser Hall rehabilitation provided a state-of-the-art performing arts center and activated space at the heart of the historic Mills College campus boosting the college's arts programs. The building's seismic strengthening approach located new shear walls and foundations concealed from view. New retractable theater seating created a flexible venue with improved sight lines and accessible seating. A contemporary exterior wood terrace opens up from the lobby and overlooks beautiful Leona Creek. The Oakland Monster Project is a great preservation and restoration story of how local community groups came together to bring this children's play sculpture back to life. Low cost restoration for big community impact, bringing children in the mix and allowing the monster to continue living along the shores of Lake Merritt. A very cool, refreshing and unexpected story. Congratulations to the team. The monster was designed by local CCA instructor and artist Robert Winston in 1952. 
The restoration, like its original commission, is the result of collaborative efforts by local groups, pro bono designers and contractors, and the City of Oakland. The monster, beloved by the community, has been restored to its original condition, enabling its continued use as a children's play sculpture and proving that community passion for cherished resources remains a preservation fundamental. The San Francisco Animal Care and Control Building went for rehabilitation. This adaptive reuse of a historic unreinforced masonry building was designed to care for all animal species and remain operational during emergencies. This adds a level of complexity to the retrofit and resiliency to the building. A large new opening in the roof created a play area for the animals, but a significant portion of the roof and wall framing remained with added strengthening and seismic bracing. In particular, Innovative circulation was incorporated, including a cantilevered dog stair. Overall, the jurors appreciated the adaptive reuse as well as the rehabilitation effort while embracing some playful style elements. The San Francisco Animal Care and Control Project is an adaptive rehabilitation of an unreinforced masonry building constructed in 1893. The new facilities program includes sheltering for domestic and wild animals, veterinary space, educational space, and support for staff and volunteers. While respecting the historic features of the building, the design also focuses on the well-being of animals by minimizing spread of disease, odors, and sensory triggering anxiety through improved ventilation, centralized cleaning system, and the hygienic materials and acoustic separation. This year, the Darling Hotel is presented with the California Preservation Award for the way the project celebrated local heritage and undertook a challenging conversion. This converted hotel's impact will undoubtedly go beyond the footprint of its structure, introducing an exciting new place to come and experience the beautiful city of Visalia. Congratulations to the team! the Darling Hotel, which introduces a new place to experience the heart of Visalia by rejuvenating the city's historic courthouse. Original interior fixtures and details were meticulously preserved or replicated by innovatively reusing original building components and employing modern building techniques. A dynamic generational story of family and community reverberates through all facets of the building, making the Darling Hotel a tangible promise to continue that story for generations to come. The Presidio Theater. First, I'd like to point out that the Presidio Trust standard is very rigorous. So in order to get everything through, it takes a village and perseverance. So congratulations on that. This is a seismic structural upgrade project and also managed to increase its size by almost 75%. But you can't possibly tell from the street, it becomes so big. It felt very contemporary, but yet resonate and connect with the original theater. This embodies a very delicate balance between contemporary design and traditional design in architecture that historic preservation wants to address. The Presidio Theater, which was revived to serve as a 600 seat multi-purpose community theater. The 16 foot deep stage was inadequate to accommodate live dance and theatrical performance. The increased depth was provided by moving the historic proscenium surround as a single intact element into the volume of the auditorium. The lobby and front of house were retained with all finishes and features restored and the 1939 ticket booth reconstructed based on the original w WPA era drawings.
The Tioga Hotel in Merced rose to the top of the list in the rehabilitation category. In addition to the beautifully restored exterior, the interior lobby space really blew the jury away. The attention to detail in the lobby is wonderful. The Tioga built in 1928 was converted from a hotel to a 70 unit apartment building for professionals and students at UC Merced with the redesign of existing rooms. Rehabilitation was a catalyst for Main Street's resurgence, bringing new jobs, economic opportunity, and nightlife to the city's historic core. As the tallest building in Merced, the Tioga is visible from afar, especially at night when the iconic rooftop sign is illuminated. Okay, first of all, that's a great group of projects. So uh, thank you to all the project teams for all your work that went into making these projects come together. They're truly inspiring. I mean, wonderful projects that, uh, so great to, great to acknowledge and to see those. So, but there's more, we're not done yet. Uh, and we're very happy to have a little surprise moment because every awards program has to have a great unveil. And so we're very happy now to acknowledge and celebrate the two recipients of CPF's Trustees Award for Excellence. It's the Angeles Funeral Home and Paul R. Williams Apartments in South Los Angeles and the Geneva Car Barn and Powerhouse in San Francisco. Both of these adaptive reuse projects exemplify excellence and attention to detail and innovation that naturally make them stand out. One provides affordable housing, but it goes beyond simple housing unit counts and instead creates a dignified home that celebrates heritage and roots. And then another that demonstrates the grit, the power, and the sheer determination of community leaders to activate a long empty historic space as a vibrant center for the community. And with that, Let's see these two outstanding projects and congratulations to them and all the award winners tonight. This is such a treasure. This is a beautiful old building that had been sitting abandoned in this community for decades. One of the most wonderful things about the project was actually working with the State Historic Preservation Office and the National Park Service because they understood that this building was about adaptive reuse um, and in fact that this building was something to inspire creativity and use, provide a place for the community to come together either as a community center or a place to see exhibitions or performances. But then we had to get uh, creative in ways that we didn't anticipate, like using tax credits for the first time on a city building. So we used historic preservation tax credits and we used new market tax credits, both uh, designed to bring places like this back to life. We're not going to make a car barn, a powerhouse here. We don't need to power the trains anymore, but we are providing a space to host community events. And so we're giving young people little glimpses of what this was while also providing them opportunities to engage in meaningful art programming. One of the really amazing things about this building in particular is that it was built in 1901 as the first electric railway system. And it continued in operation with that use through Muni and through its time frame until 1989. It really was sort of mothballed in its history of its initial use. And so we were working with this very historic, very old building and wanting to retain the layers of history and retain all of the grandeur of the space while still providing a code compliant and fully modern building for an entirely new use. Since it was an active part of the electric rail service for such a long time, it is hemmed in on all four sides by active rail lines and rail yard. So for the construction team to come in and carefully be able to start to rehab this building was a challenge for them and for the city for sure. And we're really grateful that everybody was able to negotiate and figure out how they were going to stage and you know, negotiating with all the various city entities for how they could be on the site safely. And we had an incredible 
Mason on the job who really put the extra time in to notice where bricks had changed, you know, mortar mixes changed as you moved from spot to spot or from facade to facade. Just that extra level of care that went in to that whole process means that when you look at the facade today, you really can't tell that anything has changed at all. When we walked in the door in 2009, we were totally inspired by the inherent quality of the architecture, the really beautiful light that's coming from the skylight, the proportion and the height. Even the texture of the existing brick, the existing concrete, we even love, for example, the graffiti that's been building up for many, many years. And we know we want to preserve all of that. That's an important part of the history. So we kind of look at it as a layer of history discovery and bring it to the future. And the next generation will make their own mark on this building. So this community that this building is in is historically a very underserved community within the San Francisco area. This area had the lowest number of children's services with the highest number of children. So this building in particular has become a 300 person community event space. It is also providing youth arts education services for the community. We are very honored to receive the California Preservation Foundation Trustees Award for Excellence. We started with a mortuary that had been converted to kind of a church Sunday school. And so naturally that's not designed like a typical apartment building with a lot of windows and a lot of small spaces. So we're adapting the building to the new uses of housing and the communal aspects of the housing project that's on the lot. You have a community that has years of experience with that building being there. In this case, this was their primary funeral home, and therefore that community deserves to kind of keep that building, even if it changes use, so that they can have that continuity with their memory. Plus, you get the extra value of superb architects creating a wonderful building, and it's nice to celebrate that and maintain it and refurbish it back to what it was. So you have all these issues that you have to try to figure out how the building can fit into that comfortably and not tear the building apart to put your new program in. Colonial Revival is a style that has a very elegant proportion to it, the tall and thin and lots of columns and lots of details and lots of panels and the way the wall meets the ground is thought out in terms of the base and the wainscot and the way it meets the ceiling is thought out in terms of the cornice and the wonderful detail of shadow and light that will change during the day. I'm pretty familiar with Paul Williams and then when we started the project we looked at his books and we looked at what he did and you identify what they call the character defining features like the circular stair which Paul Williams put in all his houses <laughs> and was a very very defining moment of this architect. So you have these elements that are in the building, both inside and out, and these are the things that become like the structure of what you make your decisions around. Clearly, there needs to be a lot more space made for affordable housing because the city is struggling. 
Uh, we have a homelessness crisis and we need to put people in homes. So this Paul Williams building, I mean, it's a part of history because of who he is, but it was boarded up for years and years and years, and it wasn't serving the needs of the community. So to rehab this gorgeous building and to help revitalize the neighborhood because you're rehabbing a part of its culture and a part of its history, and in the meantime, you're providing housing to these families. It's kind of a perfect world. I love everything about the sheriff. Because I never had I never had anything like this in my other place. Um, and then I like that the mailboxes are secure. The gate is always locked. We have our own gate key and that video surveillance around here. And then I like this thing. This is my favorite thing in the world. The nice cabinetry, the nice countertops. I feel like royalty here. Everybody deserves to live and comfortable housing and safe housing. Everybody deserves that. Congrats again to these great projects. They are very inspiring and thank you to the team for making them happen. Uh, we really appreciate that. They're really wonderful projects. So we're now shifting to the President's Award. The annual President's Award honors individuals and organizations deserving a special recognition for their outstanding preservation efforts. Their work allows others to gain a deeper appreciation of historic resources and their value to California's economy, environment, and quality of life. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, I am very pleased to present a President's Award for Advocacy to Mike Bueller, President and CEO of the Fort Mason Center for the Arts. Mike holds a JD for, from Santa Clara University School of Law and a BA degree in history from the University of Washington in Seattle. From 2010 to 2020, Mike Bueller served as executive director of San Francisco Heritage, a nonprofit organization founded in 1971 to preserve and enhance San Francisco's unique architectural and cultural identity. Mike previously worked as the director of advocacy for the Los Angeles Conservancy from 2006 to 2010 and regional attorney for the National Trust for Historic Preservation's Western office in San Francisco from 1998 to 2006. Throughout his career, Mike has helped broker win-win preservation outcomes from his work with the Conservancy in helping to save the once threatened 1966 Century Plaza Hotel in Los Angeles, to leading a successful fundraising campaign and sensitive restoration of San Francisco's Los Lilienthal House. Of particular note is Mike's role in the establishment of the Legacy Bars and Restaurants Initiative including the San Francisco Legacy Business Registry and the Heritage Business Preservation Fund. The organization has also spearheaded efforts to develop new tools for preserving the city's diverse cultural and community institutions. Most significantly, the Legacy Bars and Restaurants Project inspired the San Francisco Board of Supervisors to adopt legislation in March 2015 that establishes a Legacy Business Registry in San Francisco. The registry administered by the city is the first of its kind nationwide and is an important tool to recognize long-standing community serving businesses in San Francisco. The successful program is a model that demonstrates how local organizations and government can work together to protect businesses and contribute to the history and identity of a community. Mike has spent his career serving as an extraordinary example of effective advocacy and collaboration. And with that, I would like to now turn it over to Mike to say a few words. So congratulations and thank you, Mike. Thanks so much, Adrian. Um, I'm very humbled to be recognized by CPF tonight. Um, as some of you might know, my first internship in preservation almost 25 years ago was at CPF. So this award feels a bit like life coming full circle. Hopefully I'm not all done yet. Um, the fact is that CPF has always been at the center of my historic preservation universe, whether as an intern, past board member, or as a partner organization. I would not have been able to pursue this career that I truly love if it weren't for the connections made through CPF. So thanks to everyone for being here and supporting CPF tonight. 
I've had the privilege of working with many of you over the years to try to save historic places, often losing, but sometimes winning too. When I look back, I'm perhaps most proud of SF Heritage's leadership in establishing the San Francisco Legacy Business Registry. Heritage started this work with a modest aim of raising public awareness about the city's historic bars and restaurants and how many were being pushed out by intense development pressure. The project really gained momentum when the Palace Hotel removed Maxfield Parish's painting, the Pied Piper from its namesake bar. That's what you're looking at behind me now uh, tonight. Heritage launched a petition drive that quickly convinced the hotel to restore and return the painting to the bar where it remains to this day. Soon thereafter, then Supervisor David Campos introduced legislation to create the country's first official legacy business registry in 2015. In the six years since, nearly 300 businesses and nonprofits have been added to the registry, helping them qualify for incentives and a little bit of protection as well. It's been amazing to see how San Francisco's program has served as a model for dozens of similar programs across the country, in cities as diverse as San Antonio, Los Angeles, Missoula, Birmingham, and West Hollywood, to name a few. At their heart, these legacy business programs recognize the role that people, place, and traditions play in defining and nurturing community. They make historic preservation more people-focused, which is essential to the relevance of our work. In receiving this honor, I'm reminded how fortunate I've been to learn from and work alongside so many smart, creative, dedicated, and generous preservationists. People like Courtney Damkroger and Anthony Vierkamp at the National Trust, Linda Dishman at the LA Conservancy, Desiree Aranda and Laura Dominguez at SF Heritage, and too many others to mention here. Preservation advocacy truly is a team sport. Finally, None of my successes would have been possible without the unwavering support, wisdom, and sacrifice of my wife, Erin, who has been with me every step of the way, including editing uh, these remarks tonight. Uh, thank you, Erin, and thank you, CPF. This is a great honor. Great, thank you, Mike, and congratulations again. Our next award this evening is the Lifetime Achievement Award. The CPF Lifetime Achievement Award is the most prestigious honor bestowed by the California Preservation Foundation, recognizing individuals who have made an outstanding contribution to the cause of preservation. And I am very pleased to present this award to Peyton Hall, FAIA, in recognition of his work to protect historic resources and for the cause of historic preservation throughout the country. One of the leading historic preservation architects in the United States, Peyton began practicing architecture, planning, and historic preservation in 1974. Peyton has dedicated his life to providing exemplary professionalism in all of his projects and has generously shared his knowledge and interest with national committees, students, coworkers, and anyone with a genuine interest in learning more about historic preservation and architecture. He has volunteered with a number of nonprofit organizations while also serving as an adjunct professor at the University of Southern California and managing principal of Historic Resources Group in Pasadena. In 2005, Peyton was elevated to fellowship in the American Institute of Architects with this commentary, quote, Peyton Hall has demonstrated a new model for the practice of historic architecture, educated the profession and the public in the value of cultural resources, and given new purpose to some of America's most significant historic buildings through design and technology. His historic preservation projects have garnered awards, including the AIA National Honor Award, National Trust for Historic Preservation National Honor Awards, Docomomo US Modernism in America Award, and numerous awards from the California Preservation Foundation, the Governor of California, the Los Angeles Conservancy, the Cultural Heritage Com Commission, and I'm sure many, many more. Peyton has occupied a unique role in historic preservation practice in California and influenced a generation of preservationists. Many, is, many of us know Peyton as a quiet and humble guy, 
But tonight, we get to honor Peyton and are privileged to welcome Peyton to say a few words on this occasion. So welcome Peyton and congratulations. Uh, thank you, Adrian. I am delighted and grateful for this recognition by an organization that means so much to me uh, as it does to so many people here tonight. I won't attempt to thank all of you who helped my dreams come true, a career in architecture, preservation, and even teaching, which was unexpected. Instead, I want to express my thanks to the California Preservation Foundation. I attended an annual conference of CPF first in 1989 in Los Angeles, and it was amazing. I regret that it took me so long to take advantage of that educational opportunity and to meet more people from around the state. I was much better connected two years later in 1991 when I attended the conference in Santa Barbara, specifically having completed some projects jointly with Historic Resources Group, Christy McAvoy took me by the hand and literally opened the door to a packed after hours gathering of California preservation people at the Biltmore. Alcohol was served and new friendships were formed. A few years later, as a new board member, I found myself the de facto chair of the education committee because no one else volunteered to serve. The next year, 1999, the board member who was leading the planning for our annual conference in Palm Springs decamped, disappeared, leaving us in the lurch. And I was holding the bag for four tracks of program sessions. We got it done with lots of help from all those preservation people. Okay, um, you'll be grateful for the last story. Uh, and perhaps this one is a bit more serious in tone. On 9-11-2001, I had been packing my bag for a CPF workshop a few days later on historic tax credits in Calusa. I wrote to Executive Director Roberta Deering that I had assumed that the workshop was canceled and of course I could not attend because I could not fly. Southwest was not, was on the ground. Roberta replied immediately that the workshop was still on and that I would make a presentation. The workshop was very well attended. I drove 450 miles from Pasadena to Calusa and that hardship is one of my best memories of CPF and emblematic of those preservation people. So I encourage you to participate. Volunteer for events, join a committee, serve on the board. My participation accelerated my learning. Presenting at workshops and serving on the board took me to many communities and places that I would not have seen otherwise. Board members actually have fun. CPF turned me from an Angelino, uh, which I had managed to achieve. Um, and it's not because I left Virginia that I'm happy, but because I was turned into a Californian and I stayed very willingly. My board cohorts are friends for life. They're like the good classmates that you miss when you graduate. Cindy Heitzman was on our board. So how fortunate can you be? I'm grateful for video conferencing. Um, obviously tonight we're, it's helping us to make this event happen. We really need it. It provides opportunities. I don't think it's going away. However, you all are the reasons why I look forward to more meetings in person. Years ago at annual conferences, I wondered why the veterans meaning the people who were old then like I am now, were outside chatting with their friends rather than sitting in educational sessions. Now I understand. Thank you again.
Thank you, Peyton. That was wonderful. Your words were very touching. And congratulations again on your award. Uh, we wanted to go next to the People's Choice. John, do you want to go ahead and pull up the uh, results of our of our uh, People's Choice Award? Uh, we've been collecting these votes for about two or three weeks, and we're waiting with bated breath. Let's see. The winner is the Institute of Geophysics and Planetary Physics, the Monk Lab in La Jolla, California, and they will be getting a special certificate from the headquarters of CPF in San Francisco. So congratulations again. Uh, we have second place, Los Angeles Union Station, and then Our Lady of the Rosary Catholic Church coming in third. Um, so we just want to congratulate everybody again for participating in that. And I'd like to uh, bring back Cindy and Adrian for closing out. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone who's participated in the um, People's Choice and, and for, for those who attended today, but this evening, um, I especially want to express my congratulations to Mike and to Peyton and to also <clears throat> express my heartfelt gratitude for everything and all of your contributions to CPF and to the California Preservation Movement. You were true leaders. And I just want to say I ditto everything that Cindy just said, um, but I also want to say thank you to Cindy, to Chris, and to John again. Again, we have a small, very mighty small little staff that is, puts this thing on, and they deserve a lot of kudos for making this happen. And uh, so, again, thank you to all the award winners, but also thank you to the staff. Appreciate it. And all those that have tuned in tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. It is indeed a wonderful group of people here. Um, as my husband said, your people, they're really resourceful. And I agree. Um, we do have some thank yous, of course, to our staff, John Haber, who really helped put all these videos together. He and I worked so hard, but he was the one who went out and did the footage, the video and the drone footage at the Geneva Car Barn. Thanks to Christine Madrid-French, who helped put together the production schedule. A big shout out to Russell Brown in Port LA for doing the Angelus Funeral Home video. And to Aaron Clancy, filmmaker from Brooklyn, New York, who did the Geneva Car Barn video. And those are outstanding. Um, as we close, I would like to encourage all of you and remind you that CPF is a membership-based organization, and we would encourage you to support by being a member. Um, we do a lot of great things. We do, we move mountains with the dedication of our volunteers, our members, and our staff. I would also encourage you to consider donating to support CPF. Um, in honor of the Preservation Design Awards, we are offering some specials, um, premiums with donations, uh, note cards that we designed specifically for this program, um, uh, some books, and um, also Preserve LA book we'll be offering as premiums for donations. So we'd encourage you to do that. And again, we thank you for um, attending this evening for supporting our work, and we look forward to seeing you in 2021. Thank you. <laughs>